Detroit is Different is where you get information, artistry, history, music, and even comedy. Detroit is Different, a home for the culture of Detroit. Visit online at DetroitIsDifferent.com today. All right, we are back in full effect in the Detroit is Different podcast studios. And today I have a guest I've been chasing down for a minute now. <laughs> Miss Honeycomb, how you feeling? I'm feeling good. How about you? Good, good. Tawana, Petty, you have gone from the stages of doing spoken word, poetry, and writing as I've met you. to now you're like international, talking about social justice and rights for our people, rights for women, rights for Detroiters, and just what is just and equitable. So let me applaud you on that. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yep. So let's talk a little bit about your journey, Detroit. What brought your family to the city of Detroit? Uh, I've been in Detroit my whole life. So um, my grandfather came from the South, just like a lot of folks did with mm -hmm. uh Henry Ford, the Great Migration, getting getting the getting the migration going right with uh, uh making money, uh in the plant industry, um and so uh my family has been here for a few generations and I've lived in Detroit, for the exception of a couple of years uh trying to venture into the suburbs. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I've been in Detroit my whole life. What what place in the South? Where where at in the South did your granddad come from? So we have folks all over. We have folks in Texas. We have hmm. folks in uh, Massachusetts. Um, we even had some folks in California. Um, and, uh, yeah, those are the ones that I most know about. Okay. All right. Texas, it's rare to find some black folk from Texas up here because usually they'll stay a little bit further west than, like, me in Chicago or something like that. Yeah. But he made his way up this way from that way. Yeah. Yeah. And um, his brother did and um, some other siblings and mm -hmm. like my great aunt, which uh, my, my grandfather has since passed on mm. and um, his my uncle has since passed on. But um, but my great aunt still lives in her same house for like the last 60 years. OK. Um, on the east side, right on the east side. You could walk right up in her house. OK. Um, and uh, um, yeah. But the rest of my family, yeah, they're still in Texas. Like his other sibling is in Texas. They have a bunch of land in Texas. Our family reunion is actually actually in Texas. So Wow. Yeah. Where at whereabouts in Texas? Um they're like Lindale and um there's some folks in Dallas, some folks in Houston. They're spread all over Texas, ironically. Okay. And then yeah. for people that have not been to Texas, Texas has another type of heat. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's, it's kind of ridiculous. Um, it's probably one of the reasons why I never want to move there. <laughs> I feel you. Yeah, Texas has <laughs> <laughs> your skin melt off. It's that. Know, it's yeah. that hot. Yeah, Texas has a like. You got an outdoor job, <laughs> right? <laughs> right. But yeah, if you go to like cemeteries there, or you ride through neighborhoods there, like it's all our family. It's like our wow. family is everywhere. Okay. You know? Okay. And mm -hmm. from that here, what neighborhood here in Detroit? Oh, we've been all over Detroit. Okay. Um, so we, I grew up West, um, but it's like my mom's family was, most of my mom's family is West. Um, and then my dad's family was East, but we have some of my uh, mom's family, like my granddad's um, siblings on the East side too. Okay. So West side, what neighborhood? Uh, I lived uh, mostly like my teenage years off Seven Mile. Seven and what? And Chester. Okay. Yeah, okay. I went to Henry Ford after after getting kicked out of Cass. Okay. I went to Henry Ford. <laughs> Henry Ford, the Trojans. <laughs> yep. So, like I asked most people, uh, like I asked most people, and Miss Herman Davis will definitely like this. Were you over there at Northland Skater Rink as a kid all the time? Oh yeah, I was in all the fights at Northland. <laughs> okay. All right. So you you were a part of that crew. I was part of that crew. You were, you were over by the nacho stand, messing up stuff and Herman messing Davis, up stuff. Herman yeah. Davis and them kicking you out. Like kicked you cannot, out all the time. You cannot come back this weekend. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't know no better. Uh, uh, you know, I was trying to find myself. Okay, so what's the, and then also <laughs> let me. Let, I was always wondering this: fighting on roller skates is not the most. Uh, no. Okay, you already know where I'm about to go with this. Can barely skate. <laughs> Watch the crew of people that can barely skate. <laughs> right. Were, I, I could barely skate for a while. I finally figured out after a little bit, like not riding the rail or whatever. Yeah. You know, but I never got to like skating backwards. And there was some people that really like 
you know, like, like, damn, this person is like a, a athlete on roller skates. Oh, yeah. I, I have friends that, I mean, could do dance routines on skates. They was flipping and skating backwards. They was jitting on skates. I mean, like, I, I, I have, I knew people that could hop in the air and land on one leg, all that kind of stuff. That wasn't me, though. It was, yeah. The, no, the that wasn't me. The creativity of our people. Yeah. The creativity of our people. So at Henry Ford, what was, what was Henry Ford like? You know what? I loved it at Henry Ford. Um, I actually loved it at Cass Tech, too. I went mm-hmm. to Cass until like the end of my 10th grade year. And then I went into Henry Ford 11th grade. And so okay. um, Henry Ford was like meeting up with my whole neighborhood. It uh-huh. was, you know, it was like all your friends there. Um, but I met, like I said, I met lifetime friends at Cass, too. So I, I consider myself a quintessential Detroiter. Like I'm going to fit wherever I go in the city. Uh, we did move around a lot when I was younger. So I lived in a lot of different neighborhoods, but, um, but yeah, I still there, I, I still uh, communicate with like my third grade teacher on Facebook. Wow. So like, yeah, it's just one of those things. Okay. So moving around a lot as yeah. a lot of young people move around a lot, a lot today when mm-hmm. I talk about uh, being a Northwestern, I'm like you, I started at King, ended yeah. up at Northwestern mm-hmm. and uh, I'm the president of Northwestern alumni. And nice. I often explain to some of the, the members, like, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the students now are very transient. So they may mm-hmm. start the semester across the street from Northwestern, but then just due to circumstances and situations, they may be by Southeastern by the end of the year. Yeah. What was that like in high school, just moving around, as I remember some of the kids mm-hmm. doing that, whereas now it's very pervasive. But I remember some yeah. students in that mix. But what was it for you? Well, luckily for me, by the time I got to high school, um, we were much more stable as okay. far as like living situation. Um, but uh, like go- growing up through elementary, middle school, it that was a little tough because it's like you meet friends, you you get to know them and then you're you know, you're gone. Um, mm-hmm. My mother had me really young. She had me at 16 years old mm-hmm. and um, my sister is 17 and her mom died when I was three months old. So uh. she didn't have like, she didn't have a mom, you know, they were, they were teenagers basically uh, raising themselves at that particular time. Mm-hmm. And um, so that was difficult. But by the time I got to high school, really it was on me. I could have stayed at one high school, but uh-huh. I, you know, I had not learned how to, channel uh my anger or um or channel like the things that I felt that were disparities Mm -hmm. into like healthy behavior at that point and so yeah um but when I got to Henry Ford by the time I got to Henry Ford um I was still a little bit of a ruckus and some of some of my administrators who I still talk to on social media remember that um but I was always like quote-unquote academically smart just uh didn't know how to channel my emotions um but high school was amazing overall and um it, you know if I was to give advice to young people is like find at least you know one person who can be in your corner who is an adult um in the school who was that person for you oh shoot Miss Nunn Mrs. Nunn um to this day I mean I had other uh, other t- educators but hands down the reason why I'm um, consistently a poet. Um, I was already a poet before I met her, but she put me on like journalism and uh, and yearbook and just um, let me come into her room when I had a meltdown and hmm. just offer um, a shoulder and an opportunity to to kind of regroup and like and recognize that what I was dealing with, I wasn't alone. You know. So, <laughs> just growing through that. And and in a lot of ways, as they say, uh, with a mother that had you at that age, in a lot of ways, you grew up with your mother. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, what was that relationship like as as you came into your own and, and growing up yourself, like uh, from high school moving forward? It was challenging. Um, you know, my mother, um, like we are super tight now, um, but growing up, it was it was difficult. And I didn't have an understanding of what she must have been dealing with. Mm-hmm. You know, it wasn't until I became an adult that I was like, wow, could I have raised children with no mother as a teenager? You know, um, as someone struggling financially, uh, trying to figure out how to keep a roof over my kids heads. 
I'm not sure. I mean, I struggled and had a bout of homelessness um, with my own son, and I had a lot more opportunities than my mom had, you know, um, at a younger age. And so um, it was very difficult growing up um, because she was learning how to not only be a mom, but she was learning how to become an adult at the same time. So if you can imagine I, when she was 21, I was five years old. My sister was four, you mm-hmm. know, three and four. And so, um, yeah, so it was one of those things where the older you get, um, when you're able to apply like root cause analysis or rationalize and intellectualize like why certain things happen, then you can um, you can mend relationships um, and you can start to value the sacrifices that are made for you. But growing up, I didn't have that understanding. OK. And what was your mom doing at the time? Like what what was her career path? What was she interested in? What was her personality like? Because I'm sure being a mom took up at such a young age, took up so much time. Yeah. But she still had a her. Yeah, she tried to work like as many jobs as she could. I mean, I remember she went through like a lot of different jobs and uh our um most our stability came when she joined the police department Mm -hmm. um and so and i i recall um that there was a kind of like a drug battle on our street um and uh some bullets came through our house Uh, Mm -hmm. one came through our front door and then my sister and i were laying in the bed And uh, my mother came and dived and uh, we were we jumped up to ask what was happening. My mother came and dived and knocked us onto the floor and the bullet came just right. I heard it come past my ear Mm. Um, and my uncle was already on the department. And so it was that evening that my mother called and said she wanted to join the police department. Okay, so being a police officer, Mm -hmm. black cop Mm -hmm. and black cops have. Lord knows it's it's a different journey being a black cop. Yeah. What was what was that like just witnessing your mom enter that department? So on some on on one hand, it's it's some financial stability. Mm -hmm. Also, you have especially back in the day when people say that you be a cop, you got benefits. And, you know, like some of what is glamorized Mm -hmm. in the sense. But then you also have just the the racial Mm -hmm. dynamic. And mm-hmm. then also the gender dynamic. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she experienced all those things when she joined. Um, racism, sexism. Um, uh, you know, I remember she had a motorcycle accident and she was, you know, and I'm probably going to get in trouble for sharing all this information. But um, but I just remember her coming home and she was not taken care of at that mm-hmm. time. Um uh, she was m- much more afraid of what was going to happen with the motorcycle based on like how she was treated. Um, wow. And because of the property of because the, of the property is yeah. way more important than the life of the black officer. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and, and I also just, um, you know, it was just, it was literally like 24 hours a day, um seven days a week of like people coming to our house you know like um for her to respond to things and you know when you're a little kid like you don't get it you know Uh you don't get why she running down the street at three in the morning or four in the Mm -hmm. morning um and so it's complicated because i'm a i'm a social justice activist who is consistently struggling against police brutality i have law enforcement officers in my family including my sister um and um but I have I feel like I have a nuanced relationship with that uh, organization yeah. <laughs> um, based on what I experienced growing up being raised by one. So let's get a little into that as mm-hmm. well. Uh, as many people sometimes have come to me, I mm-hmm. think when it was my first album. Yeah, uh, that I had preaching to the choir, mm-hmm. and that's that's like I had my black fist up song, and some yeah. of the younger guys were like, "Man, why don't you like the police? Why don't you like the police?" And this mm-hmm. is like 2007, mm-hmm. so this is before I guess the pervasive narrative mm-hmm. of a lot of what was on social media during mm-hmm. like 2000, you know, 14, like 15, black lives 16. Matter and stuff. Yes, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. and. It's like because the role in my interactions with police officers. Right. Now, with that, <clears throat> I feel the organization itself 
it, it, it is birthed out of what was uh, slave catching. Yeah, yeah, legacy and, of slavery. And I also think that the pervasive narrative, especially when I was younger, mm-hmm. of crime is a black, a young black male. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, so it creates an adversarial relationship. Mm-hmm. As much as it creates this adversarial relationship, it's more the institution. Yeah. I have a, cha- a challenge. Right. Which it's, it's streams of thought from that institution that can be implemented as, you know, injustice, white supremacy, uh, racism, brutality, mm-hmm. uh, where people act upon that behavior. Right. And and the the person that's an officer, though, mm-hmm. when I even put myself in the shoes of the person that's the officer. Yeah. That's completely different where I'm like, how do you even rationally do this? Mm-hmm. Because when you are an officer, you can just be showing up at what they say is a domestic incident. Right. And that could be the last time you're alive. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, you know, my my sister is on the department, as I mentioned, and I remember like her first week on a job, her coming home like with blood all over her um, because uh, a person was killed. Um, that was running out to seek help. And then, of course, she also had a partner die on uh, on uh, duty, basically protecting her because he entered ahead of her mm-hmm. um, on a scene and he was killed like in her arms, basically. And so like I um, I'm very I, I, re- I recall growing up and every time the phone rang and even now with her being on department, anytime the phone rings at a like inordinate time Mm -hmm. i'm i'm worried you know and so it's not this is not to say that um like i said i struggle and resist police brutality on a regular basis i'm i would love to work my sister out of a job and all law enforcement officers out of a job by doing social justice uh work and and human-centered work that negates quality of life crime so that people don't feel um, compelled to commit crimes in order to survive. And yeah. not, that's not to say that there aren't some folks out there that need a uh, deeper psychological uh, support or help um, and aren't committing crimes that aren't tied to quality of life. But most crimes can be tied back to quality of life. You're looking at a city where the median income is $26,000 a year, which means that half of the residents of the city are making below the poverty line. So you have families that are unable to afford water, that are unable to afford taxes, which we now know over a billion people in the, uh, over a billion dollars of missed tax properties went into foreclosure. Um, you have uh, you have residents that don't have viable schools in their neighborhoods and grocery stores with healthy food. And so um, so if we address quality of life crimes, then we're going to need less officers. And I think, unfortunately, right now, the way that the city and most places are responding, not most places, most predominantly black and brown places are responding to quality of life crimes is more mass surveillance more policing, greater incarceration, and they're not dealing with the quality of life issues that create situations where crime can thrive. And so you have um, folks out here starving and hungry and feeling neglected and othered running up against officers who are overworked, underpaid, and on double shifts that's a recipe for disaster. You <laughs> and, and also, yeah. as much as you say you want to work the officers out of a job, yeah. the criminal justice system itself yeah. is one of the strongest industries mm-hmm. in America when it comes to black and brown people. So, yeah. so the role of, you know, uh, the role of first the enslaved yeah. African Mm-hmm. That later became the convict the, leasing system, the industrial mm-hmm. worker mm-hmm. that now is becoming the incarcerated worker. Right. <laughs> you know what yeah. I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, it, it's 
and, and, and very ingenious in the sense of like, hey, do you want to sit in this cell all day or do you want to, you know, make a table for Dollar General for, you know, uh, 75 cents an hour. And, it's and like, some freedom out of your cell. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's like, OK, it's not even a thought process, mm -hmm. you know, but there more is, but even in that system. That than, yeah. They're even realizing yeah. that that they that they uh, didn't calculate correctly. They don't have a room. They had a space for all the bodies that they're yeah, incarcerating. True. And they closed a lot of institutions that could help with like mental issues. Mm -hmm. And now you have sheriffs coming out in jail saying like, hey, I don't have the resources to care for this person who shouldn't be incarcerated. And so like there are a lot of realizations that are happening that I think we need to take advantage of um, that I, I have to believe even in uh, such a a system as like law enforcement and incarceration that folks don't really want to work as hard as they're working. <laughs> um, they don't really want to be in a situation where you don't know if you're going to wake up tomorrow. You know what I'm saying? Any real, any sane human wants to, you know, don't want to be um, subjected to, nonstop violence or the threat of losing their lives, you know, consistently. And, and that is what makes this such a, it, it's so much the symptom. Yeah. And, and not the root. It's, it's mm -hmm. so much of the symptom because like you say, most of this is it's people that have a lens of survival through yeah. what is labeled mm -hmm. as crime. Yeah. And then in a, in America mm -hmm. where the whole premise of our justice system is based on precedent. Yeah. This is stolen land. Yeah. It's, it's, it's captured people. So it's stolen labor. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> everything that is the basis for justice. Yeah. You're right. Is already corrupt. Right. As we're even witnessing, we have a, a sitting president that yeah. talks to the lead attorney general. Right. And on says, Twitter. <laughs> yeah, on Twitter and, and ask, hey, yeah. you know, what you gonna do about my boy? Yeah, like <laughs> don't give my boy charges. Yeah, so it's a slap in the face to even the whole idea. Of and this then principle. says that he could further intervene if he chooses to. Yes. Mm -hmm. So th this, so the idea of 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 the criminalization being a business and yeah. like what may happen of like you know like weird like in house probation for people and then you just. I guess walk up to, you know, some some manufacturing plant like you walk over to Amazon and you work off, mm -hmm. you know, selling that one bag of weed because marijuana is legal and you don't sell legal marijuana now or something like mm -hmm. I don't know what's to come. But just definitely my gut uh, looks at it as a black man mm -hmm. as I'm still going to be criminalized because that's the lens of which this society sees me. Right. And the narratives have lined up to support that. Yes. You know, I'm thinking of a city like Detroit where for a literal half century, there's been one negative dominant narrative of Detroit. So my entire life, Detroit has been seen in one way. And yeah. so whenever I travel the world, a lot of times I do this exercise where I have folks write anonymously, like, what are some things you've heard about Detroit? Yeah. And I always get back and, and I don't have them identify themselves, but I have someone else read it out loud. And I always get back, you know, all the things that I've heard. Very rarely is there a sticky note or a, a index card that has a positive attribute to it. Unless, of course, they say something like Detroit is coming back. You know, and I always tell people when I hear Detroit is coming back, I hear make America great again. I don't draw a distinction because there is a marginalization and visibilization and displacement of a particular demographic, which happens to look like me, that has to be dis that has to be removed in order for the comeback theory to be um, viable. And so um, mm -hmm. when those are read back, a lot of people ask me, like, how can you sit there and endure that? And I say, well, I've endured it in reality for 43 years. Yeah. So these are words. Right. And words do have power. But I'm letting them know if you feel guilt in hearing all of that. Imagine someone hearing that for 43 years. Imagine a kid growing up in Detroit and you're taught to get grow yeah. up and get out of here. Imagine being in a school system where even a lot of educators don't even believe that they're in a viable structure and they're having they're being forced 
to educate kids in a system that they don't believe in because it hasn't been supportive of them. And so the psychology of propaganda has um, has done a number. It's done a number on Detroit. Um, and so it's going to take a lot of respiriting um, from our babies on up, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah. And Including what, the officers that are black that are in the system. <laughs> and, and, and I love that. Yeah. That, that you're speaking to that. And that's what Detroit is different. But mm-hmm. also what you what you're going to speak to what Riverwise is mm-hmm. as well and what yeah. the Michigan citizens stand for. Yeah. And some of these different outlets to pro- provide a platform yeah. to share a message that's closer in alignment with the people and not necessarily corporate interest yeah. or government interests yeah. that are not in line in alignment with the people. And in mm-hmm. reference to policing, it's. I guess the the statement has been made and I guess even that itself, like community policing, Mm -hmm. just someone more equity amongst the role police play in our own communities where we have relationships with who these officers are. Because there are still certain desperate situations Mm -hmm. that you look at it and it's like, damn, you know, this is such a symptom. And I feel like that should be looked at differently. Mm-hmm. The uh, the the some of the things going on as I'm as I'm pulled at, at I'm pulled at ends when it comes to this, the 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 legal marijuana debate, because right. marijuana for most of my life has been like a, a second revenue stream for a lot of people I know. Yeah, that's a nonviolent like that's not so violent of a second revenue mm-hmm. stream, but it's supported some families and some made some but ends they've been meet. criminalized for it. And they've been criminalized, but mm-hmm. it's still been less of of the drugs to sell and what it's going to mean. Like, as mm-hmm. I assume that with legal marijuana, selling mm-hmm. marijuana now will be looked at like selling cigarettes or selling alcohol. So right. probably the penalties will be even more criminalized. Mm-hmm. And become more of a because you're not getting it from the system from, from CVS the or wherever. Yeah. yeah, you know mm-hmm. what I'm saying. Not when well, you can buy weed at CVS and your yeah. neighbor still sells weed. You know right. him growing that one plant now is being looked at like yeah, you know like yeah. I mean, look at Eric Garner. Eric Garner lost his life for yeah. selling Lucy's outside of a a, a institution, a store that, that was sells cigarettes. that sells cigarettes overpriced. Cigarettes. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, you're right. It, it, it becomes a legal, um, quote unquote, legal mechanism for further incarcerating us, potentially killing us. Yeah. Um, for something that was another idea stolen from community members who are making a way out of no way. I mean, there's so many examples of that when we talk about the roots of this system. And I think back at like the Panther Party and the free breakfast program and how they're criminalized for providing resources for a community. But yet and still like government has replicated those very same yeah. resources and then make them inaccessible and unaffordable to the very people that yeah. innovated the system in the first place. I mean, um, I, I, I really, yeah. I mean, it, it happened with um, a lot of people are more, a little bit more aware of it mm-hmm. with, um, and I think they're seeing more of the heroin trade, but yeah. like technically the, uh, the, the Godfather of Harlem and the Bumpy Johnson story that a lot mm-hmm. of people are watching, but mm-hmm. a lot of that, it was heroin, but it also was uh, the running numbers, as they say. Yeah, but yeah the number the, man. The yeah. number man, mm-hmm. before it was legal throughout most states, yeah. uh, that was the loaning, inst- the lending institution in the black community because banks, even to this day, are not lending anything to black people. Right. And I'm sure that somebody's like, I got a loan and it's a couple of, mm-hmm. but just... You know, the standard of lending, even even in though the, the institutions CDFIs, are built off slavery. Yes. Like, yes. <laughs> like we're the literal. Our reason ancestors are the capital. literal reason yes. they have capital. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and, but lending the black people for whatever, you know, and, mm-hmm. and it's not even redlining now. It's like, you know, mm-hmm. grandfather clauses. It's new ways to basically say you're probably mm-hmm. black. So yeah. we're not going to lend to you. Yeah. But that was what where the number man stepped in in most businesses, like most mm-hmm. black newspapers, mm-hmm. a lot of black, uh, uh, like long standing black businesses. I say if they've been around since the sixties yeah, and you ask like, who's got you money to start your business? Mm-hmm. Chances are they're going to tell you the, the it number was man. exactly. Person, so yeah. you, you take away resources like that, as you say, and mm-hmm. you legalize institutionalize them. them. 
Yes. Yep. Then make people. And then under the narrative, you know, these conflations between like safety, you know, and like uh, security. Mm -hmm. Um, And so like as an example, like, you know, or investment, you know, the lottery is supposed to be going the quote unquote state lottery is supposed to be going to our schools. Yes. Look at the condition of our schools, you know. And so where is the money going? Um, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Mama Joanne Watson, uh, used to always say like the state of Michigan owes the still says state of Michigan owes Detroit so much money, like millions of dollars. It does. And, um, and because Detroit is not advocated for to this recently, we're getting some advocacy from like out of state celebrities and those sorts of things because the demographic is shifting and they're flooding in like young white entrepreneurs and um, into the city. And so now we're getting some advocacy for certain areas of the city. But for decades, nobody, people didn't even want to use the bathroom in Detroit, let alone ensure that our our school systems are receiving the resources they're supposed to receive. Yes. And our neighborhoods are receiving the resources they're supposed to receive. Yes. Or even that we have clean water in our schools, you know. I mean, the fact that a year ago, 52 schools had their water turned off for lead and there wasn't a thousand, 10,000, 3,000 people in the streets. Mm. Um, It's just, you know, it just lets you know that um, Detroit for so long has been deemed uh, a place that can is expendable or the residents within the city have been deemed that way. You know, um, and I think about L. Brooks Patterson, who uh, the Oakland County commissioner who just died Mm -hmm. some months ago and talking about, you know, like you should do uh, Detroit like the Indians and throw in the blankets and corn. You know, so like the they openly discuss Detroit in such a violent, visceral way, um, which means that they wanted 700,000 black people to just disappear off the face of the earth. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, if there are a couple viable black bodies that, you know, can go along with the system, then we'll allow for them to be the faces of Detroit. And, you know, and that's what we're dealing with. I, I agree. I yeah. agree on many levels. And mm-hmm. when we when we think about that, I, I want to shift back to mm-hmm. just you and your journey mm-hmm. in, in poetry itself yeah. and then how that connected to social justice. So mm-hmm. so when you speak about these things, uh and drop this knowledge Mm -hmm. it's artistic as well uh (laughs) you do have a you do have a a a cultural perspective and it's real information it's serious it Mm -hmm. it touches people's hearts Mm -hmm. um and you said that miss nunn encouraged you in poetry well she encouraged me in writing in writing which Mm -hmm. led into poetry when did you start performing in spoken word so so honestly, I discovered I was a poet in third grade okay. with my librarian, um, Mrs. Britton mm. in third grade. But um, I was using it at that time just to write about like circumstances I was dealing with in like my house mm-hmm. or family or like um, trying to um, recover from um, surviving certain things. Mm-hmm. Um and it was more internalized. It was like a coping mechanism. Um, but so when it was I like got, your journal. Yeah, it was my journal. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I had been introduced to like Langston Hughes and, um, and Edgar Allan Poe and some other poets. And, um, and I felt like, wow, this is something I want to do, you know. Mm. Um, and then, but when I got to high school, um, Mrs. Nunn, uh, she saw, uh, you know, she took an interest in developing my writing on okay. a deeper level. Um, and so, you know, I was um, volunteering uh, or interning with the free press because they would do like um, high school students would write mm. for the free press. And um, and so she took us to journalism conventions and mm. um, she just really helped to develop the interest that I had in writing. And. Uh, I ventured out into some poetry spots um, in the city and I decided like I was going to try my hand at like reading some of my stuff out loud. Ooh, that was nerve wracking. I was like, it was so uh, much public anxiety. Speaking, public speaking. And I had done so many plays in school and I had even mm-hmm. sang solos by that time. But okay. it was something about the vulnerability of reading what you've written 
Um, yeah. And, 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 you know, and especially poetry that um, I just, it took me a long time to get up the courage to like really get out there with that. So that probably didn't happen until my like late twenties. Okay. Late twenties. What do you remember? Where were some of the places you would go? So there, I used to be a part of, there was this uh, place called True Essence Mm -hmm. um, in Southfield. And, um, and that was uh, pretty interesting because there was like a collective there. Like um, there were folks there like uh, T. Miller and, um, and um, uh, Mike Wright and, um, I, I, I forget Mike Phelps. Uh, okay. So like, um, and there are a lot more, and I'm not naming everybody, but um, but yeah, there were a lot of us that were there that kind of like were coming through this like oh Brent Brent Smith, uh, known as Blacksmith, and mm-hmm. so there were a lot of us that were coming through um, this like performance aspect of like poetry spoken word at the same time, and so um, and and a lot of the people. You just named, especially like T. Miller, Blacksmith, Mike mm-hmm. Phelps. They, these they have gone on to do a lot of cultural things, yeah, um, mm-hmm. and different things uh, like interconnecting. But I immediately right. say like they had to be like little homies. Like you were walking <laughs> in on them, like, like yeah, baby, yeah, yeah. I was kind of like a mom. I was like really like a mama bear. Um, even uh, though, uh, I still was like in my, I think I was in my late twenties, you uh-huh. know, but I was still like a mama bear. I was a, I was a mom. I had my own son. Um, and so, uh-huh. yeah, that's kind of like the, that is the role I kind of served at that time, but I was still coming up with them at the same time artistically. So uh-huh. we spent a lot of time, um, like writing poetry together. Hmm. Um, uh, just, we, we spent hours workshopping like, um, we, I mean, I can remember some nights us just laying on the floor, like developing our art, wow. like for hours at a time. And so um, it was really, it had a tremendous impact on growing like my confidence when it came to art. And my son came up through that too. I mean, hmm. you know, he, he read on stage a few times and then of course he went on to debate and now he's in law school, but hmm. yeah. So from there, what, what's next? How does, how does this journey in spoken word connect mm-hmm. to social justice you know what i i'm a i don't see a separate for me there is no separation right okay and i think about like the um black arts movement and i think about like the history and legacy that poetry um has had on social movements and um that is how i've internalized my responsibility i know uh the ways in which poetry has kind of saved my life um especially mm-hmm. growing up and then i've seen the impact that it has had on um, on just regular everyday people who have been in the audience um, from women coming up to me in the bathroom crying, like you said, mm. the thing that I was feeling or even just being in social movement spaces and being able to capture like um, the essence of the movement in two, three minutes. You know, um, there is very there's a lot of power. I mean, I feel the same way about hip hop. I feel the same way about music. Um, and I think about things like, you know, people sing happy birthday to you. Right. Like Stevie yeah. Wonder version. Um, but like that's Dr. King, you know, that's that's a it, mm-hmm. it's not just a it's, it's not just a black happy birthday song. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Like there was a lot of social justice um, movement activism that went into number one, immortalizing that as a hol- national holiday. But like Stevie Wonder's input in that. Um, um, and so, yeah. So um, and Gil Scott Heron, you know, okay. and so I just think a lot about like the impact that narrative has. And I think that poetry has an opportunity to undo some of the harmful narratives that have pervaded Detroit, especially for so, so long. So I guess now I got to reframe my question to say mm-hmm. what was from your spoken word pieces? When was the first time someone connected to you? and said, hey, I want you to speak at this rally or I want you to do a piece at, like, uh, an event. What do you remember as, like, the first time those things connected? Wow. Um, I would say around the time Hurricane Katrina happened. And what was the event? And who who came up to you? Um, 
it was an event at I remember a space was called Hunter Supper Club. And on, uh, at that time, at the time, Liver Noise, yeah, but now Liver it's something noise. completely different. Yeah. But most people in Detroit, if you if you've been around for a minute, you remember Hunter Supper Club. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I used to actually MC a night there. And um and a lot of like um shoot, Kwame Kenyatta. Mm -hmm. uh, ancestor Kwame Kenyatta and some others came in the space and they actually asked um, they had heard a poem that I had done um, and I can't recall it now to this day. you know I'm getting a little older now mm -hmm. but I was talking about Hurricane Katrina being like um, I had compared it um, to like a slave trade and like us being like us uh, uh, loaded up and discarded hmm. and uh it was just the way that it was written um and they had asked that i perform that again and like pull together a few poets to hmm. um to kind of uh connect to social justice okay yeah okay so w do you remember where that event was it was at Hunter's, it was at hunter so Supper they Club. did it yeah. there yeah they came some, there and some some people together and it was like okay we can do this yeah yeah okay mm -hmm. All under the premise of something connected to the social justice for Hurricane Katrina. No, no. So um, that was one of the poems, but they had asked that, you know, folks could write about whatever they wanted to write about. And so mm -hmm. I gathered, to, I actually gathered together some comedians, too. I believe like Mike Larry was part of that and Josh Adams was part of that. Um, and so, yeah, um, just bringing together some artists who uh, could either talk comedically about movement but in a like respectful responsible way and um some poets yeah okay so you shift not only to doing that work but mm -hmm. also like in connecting mm -hmm. like the production element of it yeah and working with artists and production is always interesting <laughs> yeah <laughs> I feel like that is the I feel like that might have been my moment where I've shifted I, I think I've done way more of that um, over the last decade or so than I have actual performing. Yes. Um, so, so um, yeah, I'm always gathering together different voices um, and different energies to, like, uh, create some sort of movement. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what would you say for the person listening? And mm -hmm. then also, shout out to Kwame Kenyatta. I need to release his full interview. I may combine both. But, oh, um, nice. Uh, shout out to that whole family. Uh, yeah. Rest in peace. Mm -hmm. um, and a poet himself, actually, too. Mm -hmm. so that would, that would make sense. That. Nope, he did. Okay, okay. Nope. And I remember running into him in Mississippi. Like, I went for uh, Jackson Rising several years ago and uh, just running into him on the street. Uh -huh. <laughs> I was like, whoa, what, what are you doing here? It's like, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm here now. And I was like, what? So uh -huh. that was interesting. Okay. Yeah. So, um... So the the when it comes to organizing this, you're learning as my journey is kind of like your journey in this mm -hmm. sense. Like you're you're learning things in a Mr. Miyagi way. Like you don't know how this will connect. Right. So that shifts more into organizing around social justice as well. Yeah. Yeah. It's um it is really like um it's kind of like a scaffolding, right? It's like if I put this piece here. And I put this piece here and I put this piece here. You know what? These pieces will go together good. And it's like it's almost like a puzzle all the time. Um, mm -hmm. And so um, shout out to you. Like you participated in the, um, the annual art, art festival and artist retreat that I do now mm -hmm. um, in Idlewild. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, it's just one of those things where it's like sometimes rejection breeds activism or social justice. So. Um, as a poet, you want to be accepted in certain types of spaces sometimes, like art retreats and like different um, fellowships and things like that. And so even though I have like a now 20 year legacy of like writing and performing and those sorts of things, I've written several books. I'm not always accepted in particular spaces. And it might be because I take such a strong social justice lens. I don't know. But uh, regardless, I felt that I needed to create a space where artists could feel more welcome um, mm -hmm. and would not be subjected to some of the scrutiny that happens when you are um, pursuing, a, quote unquote, elite spaces. And so um, that was really the heart of like the premise for the it. premise for organizing that wow. um, space was like 
I don't I don't need to test people into something that I know they do. <laughs> yes. You know, <laughs> so, yeah. And, and and that is in Idlewild. It was really cool. Um, yeah. Cool experience. It was definitely a learning experience. It was like I had to go out, get a new board <laughs> oh, to no. do the sound and deliver for Molly Watt. But it is what it is. It was dope. Yeah. It yeah. worked well. A lot of good synergy. Mm-hmm. Great performer. Um, great, great people uh, that were that were a part of that. Yeah. Um, and it was cool. Cool synergy. I actually yeah. got the chance through you to ride up with Mama and Neb. She yeah. rode with me, but <laughs> Mama <Neb>. nice. <laughs> so, yeah. so building these visions and mm-hmm. putting this together, what was the first cause where you're like entrenched in, cause it's been many things like right now, police surveillance yeah, mm-hmm. and uh, the, the way that, we're forego- foregoing many of our rights through like, I guess like these goofy green light systems and just, yeah. you know, facial drones recognition, and drones, yeah, all types of stuff. But what was one of the first causes that connected you to some of the work? And now you really work alongside uh, the box center. Mm-hmm. Uh, you work alongside, uh, man, this yeah, is going to bother me. BYP 100, ACLU, Detroit Justice Center yes. um, at Detroit Community Technology Project, Detroit Digital Justice Coalition. Uh, you name it, it's a lot. Um, yes. It's a lot. Because um, coalition work, to me, coalition work is is paramount. Explain what a coalition yeah. work is to you. Yeah. So, you know, there's been, there's been a lot of um, talk over years and constantly about, like, silos, like, you know, everybody's in their silo and people need to get out of their silo. But I'm not necessarily a person who thinks that you have to drop what you're doing to come over here and do what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. I feel like um, uh, one of my um, comrades and you probably know her, Lottie Spady. Mm-hmm. She always says um, it's better to be an inch wide and a mile deep than a mile wide and an inch deep. And so, you know, be rooted in the in the inch that you have. And at some point it'll connect under the earth. It's like mycelium. Right. And so wow. it's like you don't have to you don't have to come over here. and Everybody pile up for this day at this thing, because that's an inch, that's surface. You know, a lot of times that's not what you're most passionate about. So you're not going to stay and sustain that. But if you stay and sustain the thing you're most passionate about and you build out from that, then we can connect on the things we're most passionate about. And so all of those um, organizations that I named take on very different aspects of the same struggle. Um, And so. You know, and I see that same type of work in like the water struggle. Mm -hmm. I see that same type of work in education. I see. um, So we have to strengthen all of those um, those movements and those organizations. But it doesn't mean that you have to stop what you're doing and come over here and do what I'm doing, you know. And so, yeah, that. um, But but the the conversation on like the conflation between like safety and surveillance or safety and security takes us back to like the rooting, like we were talking about the history of policing, the history of criminal justice system. And um, it doesn't allow for us to have the imagination we need to create true safety because we've conflated what safety is with surveillance and policing and security. And we can get a little into that. Definitely. Mm -hmm. uh, As more of this debate of what artificial intelligence means. Mm -hmm. And to me, as somebody that works in technology uh, with what I do with media stuff. Right. It hides behind the veil of being above reproach, being above questioning. Yeah. Because it's 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 the classic lens of of this Western idea, Mm -hmm. uh, usually a white male dominated idea of Mm -hmm. like, well, it's it's not me. We can it's it's, It's look at the videotape. Yeah. I, 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 I can't control that. Yeah. Yeah. And and it's replicate. I mean, so artificial intelligence is literally like programmed algorithms by people and that so whose right biases there, are programmed into the algorithm and that right there yeah. is what a lot of people don't want to acknowledge yeah. that it's still a person controlling this mm-hmm. it's yeah still the man at the end of the matrix like yeah. it's not as if this is just 
you know, yeah. it, it's, it can't be random in design. Right. We have to touch it. It's to not neutral it. either. No. So like this question that like data is neutral, algorithms are neutral, artificial intelligence is neutral. It's not neutral. Not at all. It's programmed off of our biases. And so um, I do a lot of speaking to like masters in data analytics classes, data, data, different data scientists all around the world. And I tell them to always remember that that point zero one is it represents millions of people like it's not just a dot and a zero and a one. These are people on the opposite end of these formulas and these things that are being created. And so, number one, we have to pause and ask ourselves. Do these things need to be created? That's that question is not happening extensively enough in technology spaces. There's always something being thrown to solve a, a situation and the situation hasn't even been scrutinized to the degree like number one root cause analysis. How do we get to this situation? Yeah. And do we need a technological fix for this situation? Probably not. It might be a conversation between two people, you know, that could yeah. fix or resolve like, a situation. Like right know? now, uh, me and my friend Brandon Jessup, I'm sure you may know BJ, too, but yeah. uh, he put up a post. Because mm-hmm. he got a text message from uh, from someone from Michael Bloomberg's campaign, which mm-hmm. I'm sure was a bot. Mm-hmm. And I got that same text message. And right. it's like, will you be supporting Michael Bloomberg? And he said no. And yeah. he, he responded. And then the bot triggered a why won't you? And then he said stop dot and dot frisk dot. Mm-hmm. And there was no response from that. I, right. I just responded, hell no. And they didn't <laughs> even send the. <laughs> 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 but, right. but this form of like. Mm-hmm. Right in the shadows of what we looked at in the 2016 election of Mm -hmm. like what campaigning can be as campaigning is shifted from just television Mm -hmm. ads as people are watching television much and much less. Right. To what can be used in social media, not a text messaging Mm -hmm. And, 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 and what's being shifted. And even I know in my responding to that bot, Mm -hmm. I'm into a greater system of what will go on and God knows what I signed up for. Now that's following, you know, what I look at on Instagram. Right. And Michael Bloomberg now is going to pop up in a, uh, you know, like a lot of old school rap. So, you know, the next thing I know, red man is going to be like, I'm Bloomberg. Right. (laughs) Red man likes Michael Bloomberg. You know, I mean, but this is, yeah, that's what is that pervasive. Yeah. Yeah. And it's non-consentful. Right. And so, um, one of the things that I've, I've been working on with a teammate of mine, Una Lee, um, who is part of the Consentful Technology Project, is we're writing a Consentful Technology curriculum. And so we hope to mm. release it by March. Wow. And it talks about these non-consentful technologies that minimize our autonomy, that minimize, that take away our civil liberties. Like, we cons- we understand consent on everything but technology, it seems like. And so, like, the fact that you didn't ask for that text message, the fact that you you didn't ask for the email that they're then going to subscribe you too because they yes. they'll figure out how to use your cell phone to connect to your email the fact that you didn't consent to the mailer that you'll get because now they've connected your phone number to your email which then tied to your address yes you know and so it's just um it's a it's a sort of like it's a forced consent to be part of a system that we've been giving less and less opportunity to opt out of. And so that's why I'm so opposed to one of the many reasons I'm so opposed to Project Greenlight and I'm so opposed to facial recognition as an example is because it is giving us less and less autonomy over our bodies and our minds, how we think, what we see. Um, and it's pushing us away from creating true safety. And so true. if I barricade myself up and I and all I'm doing is looking through my screens all day at people who live on my in my neighborhood, um, I'm never going to get a chance to know the people in my neighborhood. And I'm going it's just going to reinforce fear. Um, and anxiety and so and then it also doesn't it's social control because now you're going to behave a certain way once we get so inundated with the cameras now we're at about six close to 600 around 600 they're pursuing 4,000 I believe you know and so you'll get to the point where now you're socially controlled like the way that you would behave you're not going to behave because you're going to know that you're being watched all hours of the day and it could be normal behavior and so if you compare it to China as an example where they're under a social credit system where you're now how we have credit you know how you have your credit system which is uh your 
As I say, um, your credit it's some money. Yeah. yeah, it's connected, and but you are, but you actually have to apply for something as an example in order yeah. to be rejected. Well, with the with facial recognition, with mass surveillance and social credit system, you won't have to apply. You'll just walk out. They'll know. Oh, this person didn't pay that debt, so they're not even allowed to come into this institution. Mm-hmm. Oh, this person owes mm-hmm. such and such, so they're not allowed to buy a plane Access ticket to, to go here. Yeah. Oh, and think about redlining. Oh, this person is not of high quality. So we're not going to even let them apply for a home to live in this neighborhood. And so that's what's happening in China. If you throw if you throw trash into uh, recycling into trash, your social credit score goes down. Once you get to a certain social credit score, they publicly shame you. So people there are photos of people attached to their score in the public square. So it's all it's like a flogging. It's like a it's um, it's kind of like how they do us with the water shutoffs where they spray paint blue lines in front of your house so that everybody knows that your water's been turned off or, or eviction it's going notice. to be ev- eviction notice taped to your door yeah so it's 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 a um it's a public humiliation and um and a way of forcing you to comply with a system that everything in your psychology is telling you is wrong yeah but they'll yeah. use your face now. And and now, in some instances, your gait, which is how you walk. So if you cover your face, they will have already um, identified your gait. So they can tell by the way you're walking if it's you or not. Okay. Now, mm-hmm. now you're getting into, uh, as people <laughs> will say, I'm getting into my Joe Rogan zone of, of <laughs> me being a conspiracy theorist. As no, this say, is all factually. Of, no, but, yeah. But. I've had this discussion about the coronavirus a little Mm -hmm. bit. Yeah. But who's to say, especially with what I can do with cameras, and I'm not even the best graphic designer or animator. Right. I from this interview alone, Mm -hmm. I can take and and size up you saying things that you did not say. Right. Yeah. I can take that walk. I can take that gate. I can take that face and put you in a place where you you weren't. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And it's like if we rely on the system to be truthful, but it's mm-hmm. not honest. Right. So like kind of in the coronavirus, it's like, how do we know all these people, quote unquote, have this virus? Yeah. What is the and then it's like if they're saying that this is a quarantine based virus, mm-hmm. who, who's the who's the body that sanctions what viruses are quarantine? Right. If all the symptoms are the regular flu. What if this person just has yeah. a regular cold? Yeah. And it was more so I was. And if you put them in a room with a hundred other people yes. with a cold and you leave them for 30 days, everybody's going to catch a cold. And that's exactly what I was going to say about that cruise ship <laughs> right. where they said that they locked these people up for 30 days. Yeah. And I mean, I'm such Now a, all the staff is getting sick. And or furthermore, getting, who's to yeah. say through the ventilation system, they didn't put the virus in it. Right. I mean, I yeah. don't know. Or if one person had it, now nah, yeah. I'm really going to have it. You Right. Lock me in a, yeah. you know, lock me in a, you know, it's like, this I'm is, not sick, but now I'm locked up with a bunch of people that's sick. And, and I speak to this because as you say, fear, yeah. fear is one of the number one things that I think obviously ties to us foregoing our freedoms. It's true. Li- being old enough and living through what 9-11 was. Yeah. And we remember what the airport was. Like, I remember when I, I remember was kid, walking over to Canada. Yeah. When I was younger. Yeah. Without but, ID. Yeah. Like, yeah. Stuff <laughs> like that. Like, yeah. I now remember, you get pulled out and scrutinized by Border Patrol. Remember your, your like your family, you landing and your family being right there at an airport and welcoming you and yeah. all of that stuff. Whereas, yeah. But yeah. we forego so many freedoms for mm-hmm. like, OK, what's the mitigated risk of this happening again? Right. What, what, what creates the standard? Of, but we're responding so fast mm-hmm. to fear. Yeah. And, and I would go and stigmatization, as, too, because think about it. People go like, well, if you don't have nothing to hide, then you wouldn't. Like, why do I have to have something? First of all, everybody has something to hide. Trust me, there is something you don't want everybody and their mama to see. You got that uh, right. <laughs> yes. But why is that the why is that the um, where we where we land? Like, yes. why is it that you have to be a criminal to want privacy? And <laughs> and I, I just I and just think, and I use the term criminal loosely. I know what you mean. Yeah. And, and I mean, it, the. But furthermore, like I, I will question whether these videos can be trusted in the first right. place. Yeah. I mean, you see deep fakes right now. Now they've innovated deep fakes where they literally can, like you said, with just a couple of little measures, mm. um, automate a whole interview. They could take this entire interview yeah. and make it Tupac. Yeah. 
you know, and have Tupac saying all the things that I'm that saying. saying. And yeah. that technology exists. It's not completely. it's not futuristic. It's right now. It is and completely. so it's very dangerous, which is why we are fighting this, which is why there are so many bills um, in a legislation that is trying to prevent these technologies from being used by government and law enforcement. You know, it's harmful enough to have an individual faking who you are, you know, on their own yeah. little private whatever. But when you put that in the hands of law enforcement and government, then you're talking about a whole nother thing you're talking about people being able to falsely be accused on a level that we've not seen before we already have a lot of folks being exonerated 40 years after being convicted of crimes Mm -hmm. they didn't commit um but we're talking about a degree that hasn't even been thought of yeah you know with these technologies and just take take certain people out the video yeah put certain people in the video yeah uh you know i mean this stuff is i mean i have Audio, I have Adobe Premiere mm-hmm. and I can I can through my own technology I can right. take people in and put people out yeah. put in green screen based technology yeah. and do all types of stuff and I mean I and I'm imagine not, that at the hands of like yeah at the level of le- like a yeah. person that really has a insidious reasoning behind why mm-hmm. you know I, mm-hmm. I, it could be it could be crazy just even with like back to the police officer thing yeah. that's why their cameras never work when they're killing people yeah well, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's you've seen that like um, there are some laws being passed where like those cameras have to be on like 24 hours, a day, like the, not 24 hours a day, but on, on the onset of you yeah. entering a space and then you leaving a space. Yeah. I just watched a special. Um, I forget what the TV program was, but it was talking about these raids that were happening with these little kids and these little kids were basically terrorized and not just a handful of little kids. Like this was like hundreds of kids over a period of time. And in all the instances, like the camera would shut off and then shut back on when um, folks exit, like they were interrogating Uh little kids. Um, And see stuff like that. I mean, it's, it's, Man. But that's the psychosis that happens when you are um, when you are so intricately involved in a system that is dis like the system is not honest about what the system is. Exactly. And it's so no, it's like it's, it's no not, we can't like let's put it like this. It's not one for one. We can't just we don't have access to a to a camera channel where I can just turn on and look at Donald Trump all day. Right, exactly. No, and you look don't look at my mayor all day. Look right. at my governor all day. Right. You exactly. Know? So it's not one for one. So no, it's, it's like not. for me as a citizen to have that balance. Yeah. Then, but they've leveraged fear to convince a lot of citizens that that's what. But th- to we me, want. that would be the only basis. That would yeah. be my prime argument. I'd yeah. say if you're willing to allow us twenty four seven access to you, yeah, you know, with no with no no problems with audio and video, then mm-hmm. hey, then let it be. And then we get to decide who the contractors are that put those cameras in, right? You yeah. know, then I then we can have a talk. Like that's that's reciprocity and right. that's fairness. Yeah. And then I definitely that whole argument of like I don't have nothing to hide is not about to be yeah. one of those arguments. They'll say, Well, there's certain things that privy that the just privy to the and, government and, and, needs to have. And then it could be yeah. dangerous to the you know, uh we have infiltrators and, and it's like, No, well mm-hmm. then I have infiltrators too. <laughs> Certain right. things dangerous to me. You right. afraid of Russia? I'm afraid of the guy down the street. I right? Don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I don't yeah. want him knowing all my comings right. and goings. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know. So the uh, that would be my primary argument. This mm-hmm. is great discussion. As it yeah. comes close to an end, I got to ask you classic Detroit is different questions, yeah. and I want to bring you back mm-hmm. and you and not just anybody that you think is welcome to Detroit is different. This okay. was a fun experience. Hopefully, you had some fun. Yeah, too. I did. Thank you. So. Classic Detroit is different questions. Mm-hmm. But before we get there, how do people get in contact with you? If they want to support you, if they actually, you're like me, if if they want you to perform somewhere, you mm-hmm. rarely perform, I rarely perform now, but <laughs> if they want to see you on stage, yeah, how do they get in contact with you? Uh, I think the best way would be to go to pettypropolis.org. So P-E-T-T-Y-P-R-O-P-O-L-I-S.org. Okay. And then they just email through there and say, I want to book you. Yep. Or I want to support you. I want to send you some bread. I want to send you some cookies. I want to uh, be a part of this. Yeah. You want to send me some bread. Uh, it is cash app at TH Petty. <laughs> okay. I will. I will definitely put that in there. If you want to support, please support. And she making a move today. So you may end up buying a um, buying a new lamp. I right. Think a lamp is a good. 
lamps are cool home uh you know uh, like i love lamps gifts yeah because i know just in moves people often forget it you know and they they're lighting up you know they just have that light the room light is the only light yeah you know? so classic questions uh what was your very first car uh year making model what year did you get it um, uh, my very first car was a, my mom gave me, uh, her Honda Civic. Okay. And that was, uh, it was probably about mm, 18 or 19. Okay. Yeah. And how long did it last? Not long. I had a car accident wow. <laughs> on seven mm. mile. Mm. Um, it wasn't my fault. My mother thinks it was, but it wasn't my fault. <laughs> You realize that, yeah, at yeah. 18, a mom, even yeah. if it's not your fault, yeah, it's your it fault. fault. It's like, you should have known it was oh crazy. Oh, my God. It was crazy. And it was so bad because I, the person, um, someone slammed into the back of me. Mm. And then my car did like a 180. Wow. Um, and it crashed into a Mercedes Benz on the Ooh. opposite side of Seven Mile. And the owner of Mercedes Benz was in a hair shop uh, getting her hair done. And she came out. I'm hanging out of the car. Oh, like, man. I'm literally hanging out the car trying to catch my breath. And I'm like, I, I wasn't like, I was beat up like more of the sense of being really sore. Uh -huh. um, and she said, I hope you can pay for this car. I know exactly like, that's what she, and she it's like Nobody helped me. Like, <laughs> they didn't help me up. That's, or, that's what's so, I'm like, that yeah. is crazy. Crazy good that you and walk away safe. I was a teenager, safe. yeah, and, and then and yeah, that that was that was testing the flex of that that insurance for your mama, right? Oh yeah, it did it, that was woo, yeah, woo, yeah, <laughs> <80s, I know laughs> right on the corner of my street too. Ah, uh, mm -hmm. ain't that something? Yeah, it, it did the person hit and run. Yeah, they didn't stay. <sighs> Even worse. Yeah. Even worse. All right, so. You're the DJ at the end of the Detroit fireworks. Mm -hmm. You're playing three songs. Um, and you're at Woodward and Jefferson. What three songs are you playing? Oh, shoot. Uh, well, one of them has to be Aaliyah something. Like, I obsessively play Aaliyah all day at so you work. Pick and they a get song. on my nerves. Um, they say I get on their nerves with it. Um, let me see. What Aaliyah song do I want to play? Um, shoot. I can't. I I don't know. Play? Can I play? Can I play the whole? You gotta play. Yes. Are you that somebody? I assume because you know. Well, yeah. I mean, I so it's it's such a complicated legacy now. It's because I know sometimes my mind have me thinking like, was she singing to R. Kelly on this song? But anyway, uh, I uh, <laughs> it's complicated legacy. But uh, I will say I love at your best. Um, okay. And I love um a four page letter. I love um. I, yeah, I, okay. I'll say I play at your best. Okay, there we go. And, and her version of an Isley Brothers classic. Yes. I love it. Yes. Okay, another song. Um. Okay, so this is going to be funny. Mm -hmm. I love Renegade. Um, okay. Jay-Z and Eminem. Okay, I thought you was going to say Baby Shark or something. No, like, no. Oh, this man, is you going to clear the fireworks. I love, <laughs> I love Renegade. I actually throw that track on when I need to hype myself up because I'm about to make a tough decision or mm -hmm. I'm about to go in and, like, board of police commissioners. I'm about to be advocating it. for the people. So I got to be like, never been afraid to say what's on my mind. I yeah, you know. I, I love it. it. <laughs> okay, so Renegade, I love it. Um, And then I would say, thirdly. Staying with Detroiters. Oh, my God. So I love of this song um uh i think it's called up in smoke um shoot uh what's the name of this group i'll have to i have you to. mean uh is it is it the full of smoke from christian full of smoke yes yeah. it's like their I interpretation of um uh, marvin gaze um because it was so funny because I love that song, too. My dad yes. was like, that ain't nothing but Marvin Gaye. Right. Like, but it's just something. I listen to that song a lot. And so, yeah, I would be all I would be over the gamut. I'll probably open with the Aaliyah, uh, move into the Renegade and then calm everybody down. With yes. The Christian. Yes. Yeah. Full of smoke. I love that. Um, they're Christian's, uh, I guess, ode to Marvin Gaye's Inner City Blues. But yeah. Just just like a cooler so more like thicker yeah 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 and the video is dope too oh definitely definitely yeah, yeah. but for all my motown heads inner city blues is a pivotal record yeah just 
music history. I sure. You know. All right. Last question. You could rename Woodward after one Detroiter. Who is it and why? After one Detroiter. Mm. Oh, this is hard. You know what? Actually, I would probably name it after Mama Joanne Watson. There we go. I yeah. Love her to death. Yeah. Yeah. Love she her to she, life, she deserves say. she deserves many more flowers while we still got her. Oh yeah, the 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 person of uh, <laughs> let it be known on record. Right, I did not vote for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh man, thank you so much. Thank you. Peace. Peace. Detroit is different. Is where you get information, <laughs> artistry, history, music, and even comedy. Detroit is different. A home for the culture of Detroit. Visit online at DetroitIsDifferent.com today.